Welcome, everyone. Please come take your seats. We're ready to get started. I want to respect everyone's time. Welcome. Welcome. My name is Rabbi Rachel Timoner. I'm the senior rabbi here at Congregation Beth Elohim CBE. And we are so glad and grateful to be able to host this conversation this evening. Really grateful to all of the candidates for um, making the time to come be here and be in conversation with us. Thank you. This forum is co-sponsored by CBE, this congregation, New York Jewish Agenda, The Forward, whose senior political reporter, Jacob Kornblu, is gonna be co-moderating with me this evening and the Jewish Community Relations Council of New York. And together we represent the diverse, pluralistic Jewish community. Now, um, we're here in our congregation sanctuary. And you know, in the Talmud um, collection of rabbinic writing and um, conversation, in Masechet Brachot, 31a, it says that Sanctuaries, synagogues, should be places with windows. And we interpret that here to mean that our congregation, our community, is always um, not only looking inward, but also looking outward and connecting to the world around us. And um, so all the more it feels appropriate and meaningful to have all of you here talking about the issues of our, our community and our country. I want to remind all of us that we are sitting actually on the bima of our sanctuary. This is a holy place for us. And so I ask that in this conversation, we keep it constructive and positive. We talk about issues and ideas. We talk about how you, uh, how and why you are the best person to represent this district and keep away from attacks and um, any other kind of negativity. Like, for example, we, we will have no bigotry of any kind in this conversation. No, none of it will be tolerated. No racism, sexism, anti-Semitism, homophobia, or transphobia. And if that were to happen in this conversation, we will actually cut off your mic. So I hope that will not happen. Um, so we are grateful to have all of you here. And let me just introduce who's here. Um, so Assemblywoman Joanne Simon is not yet here. She told us she'd be a little bit late, but she's on her way. We have here former Congresswoman Elizabeth Holtzman. We're so glad that you're here. We have City Council Member Carlina Rivera. Um, we're so glad you're here. We have Congressman Mondair Jones. So grateful that you're here as well. We have Assembly Member Yulene Nu, who's on the screen there. We're grateful that you're here also virtually. Um, we have Mr. Dan Goldman, who's here. Thank you for coming here. We're, we're grateful you're here. And Mr. Brian Robinson, glad you're here as well. And Ms. Maude Marone, also here. Glad you're here too. All right, so here's how it's gonna work tonight. We're going to have, we have a little applause, I think. Okay, fabulous. Thank you. So here's the format for the evening. Every, every candidate's gonna get um, a chance to give some opening remarks. You'll each have two minutes for that. Then we're gonna turn to five questions. Um, each of those you'll have 90 seconds to respond to. And then there'll be a sixth question that's a short, shorter question with just a 30 second response time. If we have time, we'll get to a final fun speed question, and then we'll end, if there's time, with one minute each for closing remarks. Um, we're gonna be really strict on time. There's time cards in the front. Let's see, can you see that? That's a one minute card, there's a 30 second card, and there's a time up card. We will cut you off. We really are gonna be tight on time. Um, we ask you to address the moderators and not each other. Um, we ask the audience, uh, I don't see any signs, but not to wave signs and not to actually applaud in the middle so that we don't need to use time on that. Just hold your applause to the end, don't interrupt anybody. Um, and I think that gets us started. So I wanna begin by inviting you to make your opening remarks and we will start with Congresswoman Elizabeth Holtzman. Thank you very much, Rabbi. Uh, thank you very much to my colleagues here on the dais, Bima. And thanks to all of you for being here tonight. Uh, this is a very important race. Congress in the United States is a very important place at this moment. I'm running because our country is in crisis. It's a, it's a dangerous time for us. We have a Supreme Court that's trying to dismantle the rights of women and trying to dismantle other, other rights. It's trying to dismantle the government's ability to handle many problems, including climate control, which will affect all of our lives and the future of the planet. 
We also have a former president who's trying to recapture the presidency through fraud and deceit. We have MAGA Republicans in the, in the House and the Senate who are enabling both bodies. This is a kind of trifecta that it threatens our democracy. This is not a time for on-the-job training. This is a time for someone who has a record of standing up to the right wing, taking on the right wing, and succeeding sometimes in defeating them. That's my record. I've stood up in many, in many cases. I stood up to Phyllis Schlafly when we had to get the Equal Rights Amendment extended, and we did. I stood up to Nazi war criminals in the United States when no one else would take them on, and we finally brought them to justice. I've taken on the issues of, of pollution in New York City when others couldn't do it. So I'm offering my candidacy to you here based on that and based on the determination and the guts and the courage to stand up for all of you in this district so that we can try to tackle the horrors of the right wing that are threatening us so seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, City Council Member Carlina Rivera. You have to pass the mic down. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here, for participating in democracy. I think that how we restore our faith and trust in government is to elect someone who can deliver on the national issues. And right now, it is a very, very challenging time. And I am a fighter. I always have been, I always will be, and I will be a fighter for New York 10 in Washington as your Congresswoman. My story is very humble. I grew up in Section 8 with a single mom on the Lower East Side, a community with deep history, with a, be a beautiful tapestry of people that is very, very reflective of the larger NY10. And why NY10 is so special, it is because it is uniquely at the center of our most pressing federal issues. We are a progressive district, a district that stands up for abortion rights, to stand up against the effects of climate change, to have mixed use, affordable housing, good, accessible transit, and we are people who know that this district can lend to innovation. It is a place that should be accepting and inclusive, and that is the person that you need to send to Washington. I have roots in this district, absolutely, but I wanna build a future that everyone can see themselves in, whether you've been here your whole life like I have, or whether you are fairly new to this city. My record in the city council has been clear, direct, and unapologetic. I am building a coalition of supporters that includes community leaders, elected officials, laborers, labor, our, our allies in labor, and many, many others. I stand here humbly asking for your support for my candidacy in NY10, and I hope to make you proud. Thank you. Congressman Mondaire Jones. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for being here today. Uh, unlike many of the people we're used to seeing in our politics, I don't come from money or from a political family. I, too, grew up in Section 8 housing and on food stamps, and I was raised by a, sung, a young single mom who, like so many incredible women throughout this district, had to work multiple jobs to provide for our family. Uh, few people could have predicted my history-making campaign in 2020 when I became our nation's first openly gay black member of Congress, and I have hit the ground running. My colleagues elected me as their freshman representative to leadership. And I have been a progressive champion and a change agent in an otherwise gridlocked Washington. Last fall, when few people thought we could get Build Back Better passed through the House, and others wondered whether we would ever enact the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, I was a bridge builder. I negotiated passage of both of those bills. And now many billions of dollars are coming to New York City, including, as I'm going to be fighting to do, to lower Manhattan and to Brooklyn. I'm proud to have helped pass the American Rescue Plan, which brought billions of dollars to New York City public schools, housing, and health care. And I have been leading the fight to end gun violence in America to the point where Tucker Carlson has been attacking me on his ridiculous show. I've also been leading the fight to defend our democracy and to protect the right to vote. I have authored key provisions of the Freedom to Vote John R. Lewis Act. 
and I understand that our democracy faces its greatest threat since the Jim Crow era. That's why I've also recognized that the Supreme Court has been an accomplice this entire time. When my colleagues on the Democratic side scoffed on at me over a year ago, I knew that it was right to introduce the Judiciary Act to add four seats to the Supreme Court to protect the fundamental rights to abortion, marriage equality, contraception, and so much more. I'm a bold progressive. I'm also someone who has a track record of delivering for the communities that I represent, and I'm proud to be running to represent this community that means so much to me. Thank you. Thank you. Assemblymember Yulin New. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I, is everybody able to hear me okay? Yeah? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm actually really sad that I can't be there in person with all of you tonight. I did not want to risk anyone's health or safety. Um, you know, I uh, have a PCR that I'm waiting for. A staffer of mine um, had just tested positive for COVID, so we're just trying to uh, obey protocol. Um, I've been looking forward to having a forum with uh, New York 10's uh, vibrant Jewish community for a, a bit now, and I, um, I really want you to know that, you know, being able to be here is personal to me. Um, it was actually the Jewish community when I was a little girl in El Paso, Texas, uh, that befriended and included my family and me, which had uh, immigrated from Taiwan. Um, it was Camp Shemayim that gave me refuge from the bullying that I actually experienced in school. And it is the Jewish community that has shown up in solidarity with my own AAPI community as we've experienced more and more um, hate and violence in recent years. So it's the bravery of these two communities that's taught me um, what it means to fight. And I'm running in this district because I know that our country and our communities are in crisis. And this is a moment that calls for political courage. Folks know um, my track record of fighting for us. Our rights to safety and bodily autonomy are being taken from us. Climate change is ravaging our communities. Mass shootings are proliferating and our democracy itself is in deep peril. And um, I've already represented part of this district in the state assembly for the past six years, 100% of my assembly districts actually in this district. Um, and for my service over those years, policy wonk outlets like city and state have called me one of the most effective lawmakers in Albany. Um, I have fought for and won reforms to our sexual harassment laws. I've passed laws directing tens of millions of dollars in state funding to community organizations fighting API hate, anti-Semitism, and all forms of hate crimes. Um, I was a leading voice in New York State's push to extend uh, and expand abortion access in the wake of the Supreme Court's awful decision. And I know what it takes to get things Assembly done. Member and new I'm running time because is up. I've got the experience and the courage to get results. Thank, thank you. you. Sorry, I don't get to see the time card. Right, so I understood. That's why I said it. So um, yeah, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Absolutely. Mr. Dan Goldman. Thank you very much, Rabbi Timonur. Thank you to CBE, to Jacob in the forward, to JCRC, and to my old friend Matt Nos uh, Nosenchuk with NYJA. Um, it's great to be here with so many organizations uh, with Jewish roots, with roots of tikkun olam and social justice, which is how I am trying to raise my five children in this district uh, where I have lived for 15 years. And I'm running because I am worried about my children's future. Our democracy is under attack like never before. Our climate is disintegrating. Uh, and the future for our children depends on our ability to protect and defend our democracy and our ability to fight climate change so that we can make this country, this world, a safe place again. Uh, Donald Trump and the Republican Party that he still controls are trying to steal the next election. Make no mistake about it. That is what he is trying to do. They have changed laws around the country. And if we don't stand up to him and protect and defend our democracy, we will not have a democracy. I did that as the lead counsel for the first impeachment investigation. And not only did I stand up to him, but I proved the case against him. And we didn't use the same tired playbook that congressional investigations traditionally use. We brought something different. I brought a different creative strategy to put pressure on the White House that uh, had not been done before, and we were able to prove our case. And that is that same creative strat strategic thinking, a new and fresh perspective that I'm going to bring to Congress to make sure that we can reclaim the right to choose, that we can pass gun control legislation, that we can pass climate change legislation, that we can do so many things 
with a Republican Party that is not acting in good faith. They are bad faith actors, but that doesn't mean that we can't get something done. It has meant to this point in this most recent Congress Time's that up, we've Mr. gotten Goldman. very little done, but we still can get something done, and that's why I'm running for Congress, so that I can represent everyone in this district and Time's get up. results. Thank you. Mr. Brian Robinson. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me, Rabbi. I appreciate it, everybody. Um, I'm a Jewish guy. I've been in District 10, living here for many, many years. I've lived in the city for over 15. Um, I'm pro-Israel, and frankly, right now, I'm scared to even raise my daughter in this country, let alone in this city. Right now, we're seeing violence against everybody, especially if you're wearing a yarmulke. These days, we're getting hit over the head in the subway. We're getting hammered in the streets. Hate crimes are at an all-time high. Um, I'm the only one to call out the anti-Semitism in CUNY. No other candidate has stepped up to call that out. It's a horrible thing that's happening. Um, furthermore, I'm an author. I wrote a book about ADHD, which I have. My hyper-focus is politics. And as a small business owner of 12 years, I'm very comfortable in a leadership position. We have to do better, we need civility. We need both sides to come together and we have to figure out a way to make it happen because if we don't, there's gonna be a time where we regret that we didn't try to come to the table and try to find some common ground and it's gonna be much worse at that time. We absolutely need civility in this country and we have to get away from the polarizations that are tearing at the seams of the United States of America. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Ms. Maud Maron. Thank you. I'd like to thank, my name is Maud Marin, <laughs> um, and I'd like to thank all of our co-sponsors for this evening and thank all of you for attending. Um, it's really wonderful to be in person. I have done almost every forum um, that I have attended, save one on Zoom, and it's just wonderful to see um, faces um, and to see people here. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I worked as a public defender at the Legal Aid Society for two decades, representing poor people accused of crime. I'm also a public school parent. I have four children in public school. Um, and those two um, areas of knowledge are incredibly important to our city uh, and big drivers of our budget, right? We spend an extraordinary amount of money on our criminal justice system and our public school system. And right now, both are in crisis. We have a crime problem in our city. Um, and we need cool heads to talk about this problem because we need to address it. It's the number one issue that I hear from people in every single community, and we have a truly diverse community here. Um, we also absolutely owe our children a path back to normalcy. As a public school parent, I saw what the school closures did to our children, um, and the impacts on, on them will, be, will last a lifetime and will last a really long time unless we immediately address those things now. Both of those things can be helped federally. We absolutely need the federal government to support um, the police uh, in the NYPD where the attrition rate is extraordinarily high and where we're losing police all the time. We need to have sufficient police, well-trained police and police who can de-escalate and do their job well, but a sufficient number of police for our community. And we also need the support for our children in school. They're going to need immense supports to make up for what they've lost, but we also need to make it clear that it's time to move back to normalcy for our children, for their school, for their sports, in every capacity that children can thrive. We need to support that normalcy. Thank you. Thank you. Assembly Member Joanne Simon, welcome. Where each, each person gets two minutes for an opening statement. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I uh, thank you all for um, your attention. I apologize for being a few minutes late. Um, my name is Joanne Simon. I'm in the State Assembly. I represent this area of Brooklyn. Uh, so many of you know me. Many of you um, know my friends and neighbors. Uh, I, we've had a long uh, relationship with CBE here uh, in the 52nd AD. Um, and I've worked with so many of you on social justice issues um, as we move forward. Uh, in, and we will need to work much harder together on those social justice issues that affect us. I'm a lifelong, uh, dedicated uh, advocate for people with disabilities. I've been a teacher of deaf children, a disability civil rights lawyer. I have led in this cutting edge field for years. Um, I have been working with marginalized people for 
all of my life and career. Um, and those skills that I have developed from working with people who need really creative solutions and problem solving really stands me well uh, in this race. I am also deeply embedded in community. I think we need a thoughtful legislator who is beholden to no one other than the community. Community is where I started. I've worked in every part of the Brooklyn part of this district on issues that are so critical, on housing and on dis uh, stopping displacement, um, on, cr on uh, environmental justice, climate justice issues. Um, that is what the work that I have done in community. I'm looking forward to hearing your questions. I am the candidate who is ready on day one. Thank you. Thank you, candidates. Uh, this question is addressed to all of you. If you're elected to Congress, you'll be representing a very progressive and diverse district in an extremely polarized country. How will you both advocate for and speak to the interests, interests of your constituents while also being an effective member of Congress and specifically which issues will you prioritize or ignore to best serve the entire district and make a difference as you navigate uh, the partisanship and the politics within your own party? The, you all have 90 seconds to respond, and we'll start with Mr. Goldman. A full 90 seconds? Um, Look, we have a lot of important priorities that many of us share. We believe in the progressive ideals of our fundamental rights, getting our right to choose back, gun control legislation, affordable housing, infrastructure, uh, building our, our uh, converting our mass transit system to environmental friendly and electrified vehicles. And these are things that we need to do, but we can't do any of it unless we first have a democracy. So our number one goal, at least my number one goal, is to protect and defend our democracy to make sure that in 2024 we still have a democracy. Then, how are we actually gonna get results? Well, we can pass legislation through the House, but as we all know, if it doesn't pass the Senate and get signed by the President, it's not a bill, it's not law. So what we need to do is figure out how we are going to work with Republicans who are bad faith actors and get it done. We need creative solutions. We need to put pressure on Republicans, not directly, but indirectly, to get gun control legislation. We need to go after the gun manufacturers and the gun dealers, and we need to investigate them. Let's see what they know about what their marketing and advertising is doing to the young adults who are buying AR-15s and shooting grocery stores and schools. That's the kind of creative strategy I brought when I did the impeachment, and that's the kind of creative strategy I will bring to move forward legislation, because the same playbook that has been Thank used you. for the last several years and the last decade is not working anymore. Thank you, Mr. Goldman. Um, the next is Congresswoman Holtzman. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much. Um, first of all, as a member of Congress, you don't always get to choose what the issues are that are going to confront you. When I came to Congress, the farthest thing from anyone's mind was the impeachment of Richard Nixon. So I had to deal with that. But you want to know something? I'm one of those people who can chew gum and walk at the same time. We impeach Richard Nixon, but at the same time, I introduced a bill. The special, I wrote the special prosecutor bill to respond to it. I stopped Nixon's by legislation that I wrote, not someone else passed, I wrote to stop Nixon's State Secrets Act, which would have covered up all of Watergate. At the same time, these are things that I was doing. So it gives you an idea that you can do a lot of things at once, and you have to. You have to be flexible, you have to be smart, you have to be creative, and you have to be relentless. And I want to say one other thing. Priorities, as I said, you can't necessarily determine them. But I want to fight for my district and for this country. I want to do what I did before, but I want to take it to new levels. Fighting on climate change, fighting on pollution, fighting on efficiency, 
taking on gun manufacturers. I wrote the first bill in this city on gun manufacturers. And I want, and I want to say also that when we can't get legislation through the Congress, and I've had a lot of success getting legislation through Thank Washington, you. what you can do is pressure Congress other Swan. institutions. One second. The, you, can take, you can take cases to court. I sued over the Cambodia bombing. You can we'll be put nice, pressure on um, the administration. And let you, you can do finish other in the things. next Thank you. question. Thank you. Congressman Jones. Liz, you were my hero. I hope I can get away with saying one second. <laughs> Look, uh, I, I agree. If, if we don't have multiracial democracy, if we don't have a truly representative government moving forward, then we won't see the progressive legislation enacted that I and I'm sure most of you want to see go through Congress. It's why I am so proud from a legislative perspective to be leading the fight to defend our democracy and to protect the fundamental right to vote. I introduced the Right to Vote Act, which would for the first time codify the right to vote by federal statute. Mark Elias called it one of the hallmarks of the Freedom to Vote John R. Lewis Act. I also introduced the Inclusive Elections Act uh, on the day after, or the same day actually, as uh, Bernavich v. DNC, which gutted Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. I am proud also, as I fight to do these things, as I fight to save American democracy, to have a number of examples of where I've worked with my Republican colleagues to get things done. Whether it is the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that I mentioned earlier, which got 13 Republican votes and now is resulting in billions of dollars coming to New York City. And by the way, I'm gonna be fighting to bring as many millions of that to clean up the Gowanus Canal, to reimagine the BQE, to invest in environmental justice communities in Red Hook and in Sunset Park, and yes, to invest in the resiliency project along the East River. But also, I have found unusual alliances at times, such as when it comes to standing up to the big tech companies like Apple, Facebook, Google, um, and, and making, and, and, making sh and, and, and Amazon, excuse me, uh, unusual alliances with some of my Republican colleagues to the point where we found ourselves at odds with some of my Democratic colleagues from Silicon Valley. Uh, and of course, I just introduced, along with Jerry Nadler, the Respect for Marriage Act to codify marriage equality. And we got, I think, 47 Republican House members to vote for that. These are examples of what you can do. And yes, when I've reached legislative impasses, I have gotten this White House, along with some of my progressive colleagues, to get to a place where thank it's going to cancel student debt. Uh, yes, thank you so much. And uh, extend the CDC's eviction moratorium. Thank you. Who's next? Um, next is Ms. Maron. Thank you. It's Marin. <laughs> Marin, sorry. Um, but that's okay. Um, so if I, if I remember the question correctly, one of the components of the question was to ask about representing a progressive district. And I guess what I, I think is really important to say is um, the progressive voice is one part of this district, incredibly important, but any one of us who goes to Congress will represent Democrats and Republicans and independents and unaffiliated. Our job as a congressperson is to represent everybody in the district, and I think it's really important to do so. Um, I agree with Dan about the importance of, oh, my kids would get in trouble for doing that, Dan. <laughs> um, I agree with Dan about the importance of protecting democracy. Um, but I disagree with Dan about how we do it. And I disagree with Mondaire about how we would do it. I don't think we put more people on the Supreme Court just because we don't like who won the last election and who appointed the Supreme Court um, justices because we wouldn't do it otherwise. I also don't think we criminalize speech to protect democracy. I read your op-ed, Dan, about, or I should say I read Dan's op-ed, about criminalizing speech. I think that's the wrong way to protect our democracy. Protecting democracy is hard. Listening to people you disagree with is hard. But our democracy is worth protecting, and it's worth doing the hard work of listening to people that you don't always agree with. I just want to repeat that we ask the candidates not to address each other, because then we'll just need everybody to respond. This is not a debate, this is a candidate forum, but thank you very much. Next is Ms. New. Thank we'll you give so you an much. opportunity in the next okay. question. I, I, I just want to be clear, I, I didn't write an op-ed that said I want to criminalize speech. So. Thank you. And, and I'm just trying to save democracy regardless of who sits on I'm the I'm going Supreme to be more forceful <laughs> next time. Ms. New. Sorry, am I allowed to speak? Um, so I, um, 
I just wanted to say um, that, you know, right now we have to work on obviously getting our, um, our, our abortion rights back, taking back our economy from the ultra rich, passing critical climate legislation, putting public housing back on the federal agenda. Um, that means also that we need uh, racial justice so that our economy lifts everyone equally. It means climate justice because we need long-term care solutions, like long-term solutions to protect our frontline climate communities in lower Manhattan and Brooklyn. It means creating also an economy where women have childcare available and have control over their own bodies so that um, they can make decisions that allow them to participate fully in our society. And um, we have to make sure that people who, um, you know, give birth are protected and enshrined in, um, in, in, in law, that their protections that they are supposed to have. Um, we have to make sure that our healthcare, um, that uh, we, are, we are making sure that um, we are actually getting a single payer system. We have to make sure that, you know, we are fighting for gun control. Um, we have to make sure that we are getting voting rights enshrined. Um, and I think that we are forcing ourselves to, um, you know, to, to take the lumps when we're not holding corporate, um, you know, uh, polluters accountable. And we have to make sure that we have immigration rights thank and education reform. So thank, thank you, you so Assembly much. Member. Council, yeah. Councilwoman Rivera. 90 seconds. Hello, all right, there we go, okay. Hi everyone. So absolutely we have to preserve a multi-racial democracy. There is no question. Civic engagement, participation, that all has to be preserved and we have to take on a right-wing agenda that is threatening our fundamental basic rights. How to get people to believe in democracy is to deliver, is to ensure that we are working together collaboratively, drawing a line, being bold and fearless, but making sure that people understand that there is someone constantly working for them. I am not just an effective member of the city council. I am unusually effective, 25 pieces of legislation on issues around abortion access, education, housing, public safety, climate change. And I will take that hardworking, collaborative style with me to Washington. And let me be clear, I'm going to earn your vote every single election, addressing those short-term crises that face us every day. But long term, we have a unique opportunity right now to put somebody in who has proven that they have a vision for not just two years ahead of us, but 5, 10, 15, 25, 50 years down the line. And we can be a model for the rest of the country for inclusivity and innovation. That is the type of person that I will be, always Thank working you. collaboratively and hopefully you, uh, as your next congresswoman. Mr. Robinson, 90 seconds. So this question is somewhat contextual, and I certainly hope the Democrats maintain the majority, but there is a chance that we won't. And as a center-left candidate, I'm in a space that tends to be where things actually get done. The nature of government, and we've lost sight of this, is actually compromise. So for one, I have a coastal resiliency bill that I want to introduce that ensures that community input is always taken into account for every resiliency project that is introduced by the city or the state because we don't want another debacle like we saw in the East River Park. And we wanna make sure that community input is a mandate for federal funds to ever be received. Number two, the mandate will also require that green space is added to the district, and we have to make sure that the resiliency is actually not just a for-profit scheme like we're seeing in Wagner Park. That said, if the Republicans are in the majority, then I'm going to make sure that I focus on small businesses. We're still hurting. The small businesses in the city are still hurting. First from COVID, still hobbling. The ones that even survived are hurting because we have a public safety crisis and foot traffic is down. So I will work with the Republicans to lower taxes for small businesses exclusively to promote growth and prosperity. Thank you. Thank you. Assemblywoman Simon, 90 seconds. No. It's on, it's on. Now it's on. Okay. Whew. Thank you. 
So how to work with uh, uh, community throughout the district so that their voices are heard. I have come from community. I represent a diverse district that when I moved here was much more diverse than it is now. And right now, many of our communities are not as diverse as they were because of decisions that have been made at various levels that ended up pushing people out of their communities and making our homes uh, not as accessible to that multicultural, um, diverse democracy that we are all seeking. So I have worked with community day in and day out. I'm an extraordinarily accessible legislator. I regularly hold meetings and other events with community because I want to do that. And when I worked in climate justice along the Gowanus Expressway 25 years ago, we worked with every single community throughout the area because they need to be at the table. Community needs to be among the decision makers. What we have too often is a top-down process, but we empower people by giving them a seat at the table, by encouraging them to participate, and by listening to them and responding to the issues that they have and in the way that they see those issues. So you have to have respect for everybody, you have to talk with everybody, you have to listen. That is the most important key. That Thank is what you. I have done in office. That is what I have done as a community leader. And it, will, Time's up. it is what Thank I you. will do when I get to Congress. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Second question. And I'm going to be really strict on time this time around. OK. Many people are not aware that the BDS movement's purpose is not only to apply pressure on Israel to end the occupation of the West Bank, but to seek the elimination of Israel as a Jewish state. Omar Barghouti, the founder of the BDS movement, has clearly stated that once a Palestinian state is established, the BDS movement will continue as long as a Jewish state exists. Meanwhile, the Jewish community in this district and across the country overwhelmingly supports an end to the occupation of the West Bank and the establishment of an independent Palestinian state living side by side peaceably with Israel. This is a three-part question. Do you support the BDS movement? And if yes, why? As a member of Congress, would you travel to Israel or boycott Israel, Israelis, and Israeli products? And how would you advocate for the end of the Israeli occupation of the West Bank, the creation of a Palestinian state, and a two-state solution? First up, Assembly Member New. Thank you so much for asking that question and in asking it in the way that you did. Um, I want to just say that I am adamantly committed to the safety, security, and well-being of all Jewish people, whether they live in my district, in New York, in the United States, in Israel, or anywhere else in the world. I have dedicated my personal and public life to fighting for all targeted communities impacted by bigotry, white supremacy, and nationalism. That has and will always include our Jewish neighbors. When it comes to Israel and Palestine, I support the BDS movement's right to political speech, and this includes boycotts and economic pressure, which has been targeted by laws that undermine core First Amendment principles. Boycotts are a tried, true, respected, and constitutionally protected nonviolent tactic for human rights and social justice movements. And from the movement against South African apartheid to the great boycott in solidarity with the United Farm Workers to the Montgomery bus boycotts to fight segregation, um, I share the movement's commitment to human rights, equality, and freedom for everyone in the region. I do not support calls to oppose the BDS movement. At the same time, I do not always agree with every single statement that's made or all of its demands, nor do I embrace all of its tactics. No movement is perfect, just like no person is perfect. But I will say that this issue is a personal one for me. Some of you may know the story of Rachel Corey. She's a young activist who was killed by an armored bulldozer while protesting for Palestinian rights. She was my classmate and my friend, and she was a part of a movement, and that movement deserves the right to be heard. Here's the bottom line. Time's up, Assembly Member New. I just need to understand, I didn't hear you answer the question. If you were elected to Congress, would you participate in boycotts against Israel, Israelis, and Israeli products? I personally have not. 
um, participate, but I think that it's a movement that needs to be heard. Um, I have, I will say that here's the bottom line. I will be a strong voice in Congress against occupation and in support of equality, justice, and a thriving future for all Israelis and Palestinians. And I think that the only way that we get there is through direct negotiations between the Israelis and the Palestinians. And there are many shapes an agreement might take, including a two-state solution. If that's where the parties land, I'll fully support it. And I believe that our tax dollars should never be used to violate human rights, um, which is why I support legislation that would prevent thank, federal Thank you. Funds. I need to stop you now. Thank you very much. Sorry. Okay. Um, Sorry, uh, Congressman Jones. <laughs> I oppose the BDS movement, and I've been on the record for a very long time, since my days in college, in fact, opposing the BDS movement. Uh, I have been to Israel, and I have been to the West Bank with an organization called J Street, which may be familiar to some people in this room. I strongly favor a two-state solution. I have the perspective to understand that that requires thoughtfulness, integrity, fairness, uh, conditions that actually keep both sides of this issue at the table, rather than facilitating one side walking away. And I think it's important to have a member of Congress representing this beautifully diverse district who gets that and who has a track record on these issues. I support the safety and security of Israel, and I've also not been afraid to say that I disagree with the number of actions taken by the Israeli government. Both of those things can be true. And from what I sense and from the data, that is mainstream among the American Jewish population. Um, when I met with Naftali Bennett last fall, I looked him in the eyes and I said, there's an entire generation of young American Jews that has some real issues with what your government has been doing. We need someone who's willing to say that while supporting Iron Dome to make sure that the Jewish people are safe. Thank you, Congressman And we Jones. can do that while supporting Palestinian human rights, equal treatment under the law, for example. Time's up. Thank That's you. the kind of congressman I'll continue to be as your representative. Thank you. Mr. Robinson. Where is the outrage from those who agree with BDS for the Uyghurs in China, where there is a literal genocide, a cultural cleansing happening right now? Are you boycotting, are you boycotting Chinese products? Let me ask you that. Israel is not part of anything such as that type of behavior. Of course, I condemn BDS. And not only that, a two-state solution for Israel is up to Israel. We have no right to tell them how to run their country. Now, we can have different opinions about Israel, but BDS is an anti-Semitic movement. And to hear the words of Yulene really strike at the heart of what Jews have to go through and have gone through for 2,000 years. And one of the reasons this is anti-Semitic is because when you support a movement that delegitimizes Israel's right to exist, you take away the safety of Jews and the right of return. Because if we've learned nothing in the last 2,000 years, it's that anti-Semitism is resurgent. It always comes back. It's raging again. And we have safety in Israel. We have to protect Israel. And it's not up to us to tell them how to run their government. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Marin. Um, thank you. Um, I'm going to agree um, with Mondaire and Brian on this. I absolutely oppose the BDS movement. And I do think that what we, there are a lot of people who try to um, pretend that the anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism. As a Jewish woman raising four children in this city, we've seen anti-Semitism rise in the city. I live adjacent to Chinatown. We've seen anti-Asian hate violence rise in the city. And that kind of hate directed towards our community um, really has no place here. And when we talk about fighting anti-Semitism at home, we also have to understand its international dimension. Israel is fighting not just anti-Semitism, Israel is fighting to exist. And Israel is a partner to the United States. As a congressperson, of course, I would travel to Israel. Um, I also think it's worth 
remembering that the United States relies on Israel for intelligence. Um, dealing with a nuclear Iran is a very serious issue that has been on our personal agenda as Americans, and Israel has been a, a unique and helpful, really vital partner to the United States in order to pursue um, those international goals. So I think we have to really be clear when we, when we hear people talking about um, the right to protest and they're really just talking about anti-Semitism, whether it's here locally in our community or whether it's internationally, um, we need to be opposed to it. Thank you. I didn't like, uh, could I just say that my name keeps on being mentioned by, by Brian and I just wanna say that, you know, um, I, I think I should deserve a little time to respond. I'm gonna make up my way down the line, give everybody a chance to speak. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think you had, I, I gave you extra time to speak, um, so I, I think we're good. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna continue down the line. So, Assemblymember Simon. Thank you. I know it was a three-part question. Hopefully I remember all three parts. Um, so, no, I do not support BDS. Um, I believe that we need a two-state solution, but I believe that Israel and Palestine need to be at the table, and we need to help the parties come together. Uh, a two-state solution will not happen if we uh, try and force it. Um, it has to be a, a, a decision that is created and brought together by the parties by the parties who are going to be living together and need to live together um, and support the right of a Jewish state to exist. That can't be debated. Israel does have a right to exist, and that cannot be the kind of thing that we uh, can put forward and hope ever to have a two-state solution. Um, so we need to be there. I would, of course, uh, visit Israel. I'd love to visit Israel um, because, you know, you can learn. That's how you learn. You visit, you talk to people, you learn from people. Um, and I think that is an appropriate role for a member of Congress as well. And um, uh, while we also uh, provide support for Israel to defend itself, uh, so, yes, I support the Iron Dome, for example. Um, but I don't support um, activities that would uh, expand, for example, the settlements um, that uh, would exercise, you know, violations of human rights. That's something I would, would call out on, in any government. Thank you, Assemblyman uh, Bersenman. And I would do that as well and disagree with certain policy decisions that are made. And I think that's what we all need Thank to you. do. Thank you. Time's up. Thank you. Ms. Holtz, uh, I'm sorry, Congresswoman Holtzman. Thank you, I'm sorry uh, to be a little clumsy about this. Uh, I actually remember uh, the day the State of Israel was created kind of dates me, but my grandmother sat, sat me and my twin brother down, turned on the radio, and said, I never want you to forget this day as long as you live. And so I haven't. I've, I've had the privilege of going to Israel many times, um, uh, at, both as a member of Congress and uh, as New York City controller, and when I was district attorney, I met with prime ministers. I met with Anwar Sadat when he came to Israel. I figured if he could come to Israel finally, I could go to Egypt. Um, I'm totally opposed to the BDS movement. I strongly favor um, a two-state solution. I'm not in favor of expansion of settlements. I'm a strong advocate of human rights and civil rights. You talked about how we would deal with Israel, question about that. One of the things is, a, as a former member of Congress, I was asked to participate in a conference with Israeli women on the status of women. That conference, and I was proud to participate in it, led to the creation of a women's movement, nonpartisan, non-party controlled in Israel that became the foundation of the growth of, women's, of a, a strong women's rights movement. So we can contribute to, to the growth of Israel and of democracy in Israel and human rights in Israel through our Thank you. Uh, participation. Time's up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Goldman. 
Um, I got a lot I want to say on this, so I'm going to be quick. First of all, uh, I categorically denounce the BDS movement. It is anti-Zionist. It is anti-Semitic. Um, and let's make something really clear. It's not a First Amendment issue. Of course, anyone who believes it has a First Amendment right to say they believe it. It's the fact of supporting it that is the problem here. Second, I have been to Israel. Um, I, my support for Israel predates any political expediency. Um, my grandfather was one of the founders of Birthright. My aunt served as a chair on the board. Uh, Israel is a part of my family. My wife has studied extensively there. We need a robust diplomacy. Uh, we cannot be so naive as to think that, oh, it, we'll just back off and the Palestinians and the Israel, Israelis will come to the table. That has never happened and that will not happen. So as from my experience from almost 18 months on the House Intelligence Committee where I had direct access to the State Department officials, foreign policy officials, intelligence officials, what I can tell you is that we need to use diplomacy to move each of them a little bit closer with good faith measures so that we can demonstrate that there can be some trust. But we must support Israel, a democracy, uh, as, as a two-state solution, the only way to keep Israel both a Jewish state, which is essential, and a democracy, which is also essential, is the two-state solution. We disagree with Thank a lot you. of things, Time's just up. like we disagree with democracy at home, but we must have un pre unconditional support Time's for up. Israel. Thank you. Councilmember, we're going to hold applause. Thank you. Councilmember Rivera. I do not support the BDS policy. I do not think it advances the ultimate goal of a peaceful two-state solution. We can have a safe and secure Israel and, of course, a free and independent Palestinian state. I think it is up to us to try to also advance the goal of bringing parties to the negotiating table, both sides. And I feel having an open conversation with stakeholders is going to be important to our growth and development as legislators and as your representatives. I have been to Israel, and I want to thank my friends at JCRC for organizing a very thoughtful trip that really brought us closer to trying to understand generational conflict. So that is the legislator that I will be, thoughtful, open, inclusive, and always, always willing to learn and listen. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just repeat before the next question, please candidates do not address each other. We'll give you an opportunity to respond to any accusations or any mentions by another candidate in your closing remarks. Uh, the next question is also a three-part question. So I hope you um, remember. <laughs> I'm sure you have all seen the statistics anti-Semitic incidents across the United States have reached an all-time high last year, 2,717 incidents, the highest number on record since the ADL began tracking anti-Semitic incidents in 1979. New York. The state of New York led the nation with 416 reported anti-Semitic incidents last year. And according to the NYPD, 198 of the 524 hate crime incidents reported here in New York City last year targeted Jews, including 34 assaults against Jews here in Brooklyn. In the first three months of this year, the city recorded 86 attacks on Jews, and the NYP tallied 23 attacks just last month. What is your understanding of the problem of anti-Semitism, and how do you think it relates more broadly to the hate violence we're seeing across the country? Number two, what do you believe is the role of government and political leaders in addressing the matter head on? And thirdly, would you advocate changes to federal hate crime laws? And if so, what changes would you support? 
again, 90 seconds for each candidate to respond, and we'll go to Congresswoman Halsman first. We'll, we'll keep. Start if you want. Okay, Councilwoman Rivera, you want to go? <laughs> okay, um, I think I, I think I got all three parts, so I'm going to try my very best in 90 seconds. So, anti-Semitic attacks, the troubling statistics we heard, the hate that is in every community across New York City against our Jewish community, our Muslims, our LGBTQ, our AAPI, our black community. It is not only a threat to our democracy, it is a threat to our, uh, who we are as human beings and our morality. It is up to us to use our platform to speak out against hate in every single form. It is also up to us to invest in communities. Those are the safest communities, are the ones that are invested in. As a member of the city council, we have, done, we have invested an unprecedented amount of money in community, your, your tax dollars, community-based organizations that understand these issues in a nuanced way and approach them with cultural humility. We have to continue funding those organizations. We have to continue with complementary strategies, working with law enforcement to address the root causes of violence and hate and to ensure that housing, healthcare, workforce opportunity, everything is invested in at the same time. I am absolutely for strengthening laws to protect people who are victims of hate, and I will stop at nothing to ensure that every person in this city and in this country not only feels safe, but feels supported by their government. Thank you. Assemblywoman Simon. Thank you. Um, I will also try and answer all three things in 90 seconds. Uh, number, what was the first part? <laughs> uh, <Whoa>. No, <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, clearly, uh, we have seen a, a tremendous increase in anti-Semitic incidents. We have seen a tremendous increase in hate crimes uh, generally, uh, in, is particularly in the last uh, five years or so. Uh, but uh, the level of anti-Semitic uh, incidents um, are, is very much on the rise. And certainly in the state legislature, we have in fact provided a lot of assistance to communities because it is communities that actually will be doing that work on the ground to provide those services and to provide the education. Because I think fundamentally what happens is people do not understand. Ignorance is a great danger in this country. We have so many people who are ignorant. They do not know each other. They do not get to know each other. They do not know how to walk a mile in their shoes. Um, we have to be about changing that picture. As a disability civil rights lawyer for so many years, I know that, in fact, people who are subject to prejudice, who are historically marginalized, we often don't know very much about their lives. We don't know how they live, and we don't know what we have in common. And so I think going forward, one of the main things we need to do, and this is what I would do as a Congress member, is to continue to work with everybody to make sure that we learn to understand each other, that we understand each other's lives, and that we can be part of the solution so that we can decrease hate crimes. And I will also just mention my hate crime bill uh, in the state legislature, which would create a rebuttable presumption Thank you. So if somebody bops you over the head Thank and doesn't you, say something, Assemblywoman. you can be prosecuted. Thank you. Mr. Goldman, 90 seconds. The ADL audit that you're referring to also shows that, first of all, the hate crimes, uh, anti-Semitic hate crimes are underreported, and second of all, they've increased by four times in the last eight years. AAPI hate crimes have increased over three times in the last year. What is this coming from? Domestic violent extremism and white supremacy, which the FBI director said is the number one threat to our country right now. So what do we need to do? We need to pass a law that defines domestic terrorism, and we need to be able to prosecute people. We need to increase sentencing enhancements for hate crimes. For any discriminatory motive that is used in furtherance of a crime, you get a sentencing enhancement in federal, uh, in federal law, not, not the state law that Joanne was talking about. 
Um, so we, we have to recognize that uh, the source of so much of this rise in white supremacy, rise in hate crimes, is Donald Trump and his draconian immigration policies that were racist, xenophobic, and destructive to our country. So one thing that we cannot allow to happen is for him to become president again in 2024 and implement his immigration policies that were so destructive to our communities that gave rise to white supremacy. This is an issue not just for democracy, but it is an issue for uh, leveling the playing field in our society and giving everyone the same opportunities to succeed, the same opportunities to seek the American dream. Thank you. It is both an immigration issue and it is a hate crime issue. Thank you. Congressman, Congressman Jones. Anti-Semitism is a form of white supremacy. I don't know what it's like to be Jewish, but my heart breaks for my Jewish brothers and sisters. I do know what it's like to be discriminated against and to be attacked because of who I love and what I look like. And I've got enough sense to know, and as your representative would have enough sense to know, that anti-Semitism and white supremacy pre-existed the arrival of Donald Trump in this country. Uh, he didn't happen overnight. This has been bubbling up within the Republican Party, for example, for generations. And we need someone who's gonna take on this challenge systemically. And I say this as someone who, one of the first things he did was vote to impeach Donald Trump as a sitting member of Congress early last year. We, of course, need to pass in the United States Senate a bill that I helped pass out of the Judiciary Committee and out of the House called the Domestic Terrorism Prevention Act. Uh, it is legislation currently being held up in the Senate by a man named Ron Paul. Uh, and we can get this done, but we've got to keep fighting for it. We also can't look at hate crimes like what happened at Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh in a vacuum. We know that the epidemic of gun violence, the ease with which people can access weapons of war has facilitated the violence that we are seeing in our communities, which as many people have noted, isn't just towards the Jewish community, but also towards other communities. It's why I'm really proud to be leading the fight to end gun violence, to have Thank already helped you. pass uh, the Bipartisan Safer Thank Communities you, Act, and this week to be voting on a ban on assault weapons for the Thank first you. time in 30 years. Thanks so much. Congresswoman Holtzman. Thank you very much. Anti-Semitism is a long problem. I grew up living with it. Right outside of New York City, you could see signs that said, restricted, no Jews, no blacks, no dogs allowed. I got beaten up on the way to Hebrew school when I was a kid. These are old problems. But we, unfortunately, for the first time in my lifetime, have a president, had a president, who fostered it and supported it. When Donald Trump said to those marchers in Charlottesville who were carrying Nazi, they, Nazi torches and saying no Jews will replace us, when Donald Trump said to them that they're good people on both sides, that was an encouragement and a support that was disgusting and despicable. Think of the letter that George Washington sent to the Jewish community in Savannah and in Newport, how far we have fallen. But I think there's lots that can be done. When I was district attorney, to prevent violence. Laws are important, strengthening them is important. We were able to work, when I was DA, with the different communities that were at each other's throats, talking to people, reaching out. We had no riots when I was district attorney. I hope some of that kind of outreach was really important. But I think also we have to make sure that people understand what kind of hatred we have in this country and oppose it. We can't, the people who want to stop us from writing in our books and teaching in our classrooms, the Thank hatred you. that has spewed out before are just going to perpetuate it in the future. Thank you, Congresswoman. Mr. Robinson. Thanks. Um, certainly, nationally, the far right is a huge problem. Um, you've got Marjorie Taylor Greene talking about Jewish lasers in space, setting up fires in California. Um, the Jews will not replace us in Charlottesville. Yes, good example. But we're talking about District 10 in New York City, and we're talking about representing District 10 in New York City. And I'm sorry, 
Hate crimes are not a function of white supremacy in District 10. It has no color. Hate has, any, people who possess hate in their heart, it has nothing to do with color. But you don't see a whole lot of white supremacists saying Jews will not replace us in District 10. This is a general violence problem. And anti-Semitism is on the rise for a whole lot of reasons. Number one, every time Israel and Hamas exchange missiles, if you're wearing a yarmulke, you're way more likely to get punched in the face. And if you're wearing a yarmulke, period, you're way more likely to get punched in the face. And this is an ongoing problem. Yes, it's up. It's down. It's up. Anti-Semitism, it's the past 2,000 years. You know, we have to remember that it comes from both sides, the far left and the far right. And if we're not willing to admit that and define the problem for real, then we're never going to solve it. Thanks. And I have a hate crime legislation all ready to go in Congress to properly categorize and prevent hate crimes across the nation. Thank you. Councilwoman New. Assemblymember. Oh, se <laughs> sorry. <person. laughs> sorry. Sorry, I was prepared for it. Assemblywoman, <laughs> I take that back. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so, first off, uh, you know, this isn't a theoretical issue for me. I live in this district where we've seen um, bigotry and hate in many forms from the anti Asian violence to the anti Semitic violence to swastikas drawn on buildings. You know, I've personally made calls to the city to help um, organizations get hate speech and swastikas cleaned off their buildings. I myself painted over some. All of this hate has an intense and corrosive effect on our society. I believe that our elected officials at every level must be bold in strengthening protections for our Jewish communities in our city and cracking down on acts of hate with stronger federal legislation. Unfortunately, the Republicans um, have lockstep refused to support strengthening hate crime legislation or domestic terror legislation because these bigots are their base. They actually organize with them. There was actually an article today talking about a particular person running who is literally organizing with them. I will fight for additional hate crimes, enforcing funding in Congress, and I will continue to be a visible, active, and available member of my community should local incidents occur. And I will not be silent, and I will not hedge my words, and I will stand arm in arm with the Jewish community to defend their dignity, their right to exist, and the right to enjoy life without harassment, abuse, or violence. Thank you, Ms. Maron. Thank you so much. Um, I'll, I'll take the last part of your question first about federal hate crimes. Um, I don't think we need to pass new laws. What I think we need to do is prosecute the laws that we already have on the books. Um, when someone's assaulted, for whatever reason, that assault needs to be prosecuted. And I think sometimes passing hate crime legislation, um, it's really hard. You don't have to prove why someone assaulted someone. Passing hate crime legislation is a way for politicians to say they've done something, but it doesn't actually change what's happening on the street. What will happen on the street, what will reduce anti-Semitic attacks and all other attacks on our street is restoring um, public safety to our streets. And from our Congress and on a federal level, we need to support that, that reimposition of law and order. I will also say directly to the issue of anti-Semitism, um, a shocking number of students, uh, of young people today, haven't heard of the Holocaust and don't know what it is. What we teach our children in school matters enormously to how they treat one another. And the words we hear all the time about inclusion are wonderful, but what we need to do is stop teaching children to look at each other and see differences and start teaching children um, the, our actual history and what brings us together in terms of our common humanity. Thank you. We're on our fourth question. Many people fear that we are in a multifaceted existential crisis of environmental catastrophe, extreme wealth and economic inequality, and armed white supremacist patriarchal autocratic forces that are threatening our democracy and way of life. In the midst of these crises, there is also a sense among many that Congress is unable to do its job and unable to function effectively. Yet you are seeking a seat in Congress as a member of the Democratic Party. How practically do you intend to make a difference? We'll start with Congressman Jones. That is a tall order to answer in 90 seconds, but let me try my best. Uh, I am proud of the things that Congress has done successfully this past term 
even as I have a litany of things that I would love for Congress to do and a litany of criticisms, including of my Democratic colleagues who I feel should be fighting harder for the things that we say we believe in as a Democratic Party. I do battle with Republicans, and I push my Democratic colleagues to be better. We have seen, through the passage of the American Rescue Plan, which brought billions of dollars to New York City public schools and for housing, and vaccinated a nation in the midst of a deadly pandemic, what government can do for the people, as we say in the House. I'm really proud also, as I mentioned, to be bringing billions of dollars to New York City through the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. But we know that we need to pass the Build Back Better Act, not just because of the planet-saving climate provisions contained in that legislation, but also because of the universal child care provisions that I helped author. And we also need to pass a Green New Deal. And by the way, as we get resources for this district, I will reiterate, given the climate emergency that you just described, we need to make sure that we are investing in environmental justice communities, our most marginalized communities, to make sure that they have the resiliency. And yes, the good paying union green jobs to be created from that. We can do all of these things and so much more. And I say this as someone who's at the same time been pushing the White House to use executive action where Thank there you, has been up. legislative impasse because people like Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema don't know what a Democrat should be in the year Thank 2020. Thank you. Time's up. Mr. Robinson. So uh, I am a liberal, but I don't define myself as a progressive. And the reason I don't is because progressives are great speakers, and I think they have good hearts, but they don't get much done in government. Um, we need people who can actually get things done. And in terms of practicality, that's what I bring to the table. In terms of actually implementing policy that works for everybody, that's what I bring to the table. Empowering small businesses, bringing federal oversight to the homeless shelters who are negligent and let violent offenders terrorize neighbors, neighborhoods as well as 80% um, of the homeless population who had never heard a fly. These are the things that we need to focus on. Um, you know, climate change. Certainly, uh, with my resiliency policy, um, we are prepared to do that. But I'm a liberal, I'm not a progressive. And one of the reasons I reject modern progressivism is because they don't get things done legislatively. Look at AOC's record if you need a source on that. Thank you. Congresswoman Holtzman. I guess as a liberal progressive, progressive liberal, I'll just list all the things I was unable to do in Congress, like bring Nazi war criminals to justice after no one paid attention to them for more than 30 years. What else was I able to do? Uh, get the Equal Rights Amendment passed, ex extension passed, passed with Senator Kennedy the Refugee Act, which is the foundation for the admission of all refugees to the United States of America. These are the things that I couldn't do. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to look. Um, couldn't do as a liberal and as a progressive. I want to say here in New York City, also carrying forward my liberal progressive uh, can't do agenda, I was able to, I was the only district attorney in America to stand up against racial discrimination in jury selection and got the Supreme Court to halt it. Also, as my can't-do agenda, I was able to stop the city of New York from building nine polluting incinerators, and we got the whole program of municipal incinerators shut down. Well, these are the things I could not do as a progressive liberal. I don't know what you wanted to call me, but I was, couldn't do it. And I just want to say, in terms of what to do in Congress, my first efforts would be, number one, before I got to Congress, is to call on Congress not to take the August recess and start investigations into the Supreme Court justices Thank you. Who, about up. whom serious questions have been raised. Time's up. Because we you. have to deal with a runaway Supreme Court. Thank you so much. And also deal with guns. Thank you. Assembly Member Simon. Could you repeat the question? Beside the existential... Right. You want the existential part? I'm asking. Okay. I'm asking. Given the, long the given the, the size of the of the crisis right. we're in, and given Congress's 
inability to function effectively? Why are you seeking a seat in Congress? What do you think you can accomplish there? So here's the thing. We are in an existential crisis in so many areas. But the reality is these have been long simmering and have gotten us to this point now. And what happens and what we have to fight against is this notion that we can't do anything. And so having served uh, in the legislature with a Senate that would say no to almost everything, I've been in that position where it's frustrating to be a member of the state assembly because we were passing progressive legislation, uh, uh, future-looking legislation again and again and again. We codified Roe versus Wade on the assembly side again and again and again. And it was only by flipping the Senate that we were able to make that progress. And of course, once we flipped the Senate, uh, flipped the, Senate the Senate took credit for it. But that's politics, that's what happens. Um, so we need to have hope, we need to be focused, and we need to be creative. And we do need to investigate. Um, I'm all for canceling the August recess and investigating uh, Supreme Court judges because they are bought and sold by dark money, and they are not there to protect American democracy under any way, shape, or form. So I think that you can't go in saying we're not going to get anything done. Because when I passed the red flag law in the New York State Assembly for the first time, I had half of the Republicans voting for it. Because you know what? Nobody wants their kid to be shot by somebody who shouldn't Thank have you. a gun. Thank you. Time's Thank up. you. Turning now to Mr. Goldman. This is the question that we need to answer. You will hear from all of us up here so many aspirational ideas. So many of us believe in so many similar progressive ideals of how to move our country forward. But none of it is getting done. And what I am going to bring is a different approach. You have to recognize the Republicans are not going to come to the table unless you make it clear that it's in their own interest to do so. So how do you do that? One investigations and oversight. We have to use the investigative tools of Congress to put pressure on the Republicans. No one up here has taken on Donald Trump, has taken on these Republicans, and the MAGA Republicans, like I have, and prove the case against Donald Trump. Two, we also need to convince them that some of our policies are actually in their interest. Let me give you an example. We want renewable energy because it will save the climate and create jobs. But Republicans want energy independence. Well, renewable energy creates energy independence. This is how Republicans got on board with mass decarceration is because it was fiscally helpful. We need a different way of thinking about things that I brought to the impeachment and that I, in Washington, in Congress, and that I will bring as a congressman. Whatever may happen in Albany, is very different than dealing with MAGA Republicans Thank in D.C. Thank you. Time's up. And we need someone with the experience to do that. Thank you. Councilmember Rivera. Thank you. Um, this is a great question. Many of us actually up here have served during a time of a Donald Trump presidency. It was volatile. The, rhetor the, the, the rhetoric was hateful and it created such bigotry. Yes, white anti-Semitism is the fuel for white supremacy, but our immigrant communities, our LGBTQ communities, they were constantly under attack. So I do not want to, I want to emphasize how important it is to know how to serve a diverse group of constituents and show up every single time. When you are going to Washington, your obligation is to your constituents and to be an effective legislator first and foremost. I have that experience. And moral courage can be defined in many, many different ways. It includes taking bold stances that might not necessarily be popular and following through and being clear, direct, and unapologetic. Abortion access and us leading the fight to establish the nation's first municipal fund 
creating resilient and social infrastructure along the coastline when our NYCHA families experience eight feet of water. We did that here in New York City too. Creating livable streets and prioritizing mass transit. We did Thank that you. here in Time's District up. 10 as well. Thank you. I will do that as your Congresswoman and we have to work and make sure Thank that you. we are always focusing on being collaborative. Thank you, Ms. Marin. Um, so with regard specifically to climate change, I'll just say that I do think what we need to do is bring more voices to the table. There's a lot of information, just slapping green or Green New Deal on something doesn't actually get anything done. We're learning right now how toxic some of the solar panels are that have been um, in use for a long time and how much they're going to fill our landfills right now. If you want to actually listen to um, solutions, you're going to have to listen to where they come from all over the place. I spent a lot of years, I mentioned I'm a public school parent, fighting against some of the Bill de Blasio programs, proposals for our schools that I didn't agree with. Um, and I spent the last two years fighting to get our schools reopened and to get our kids restored to the kind of normalcy they deserve. Um, and to do that, I worked with parents um, that were Democrats like me. I worked with Republicans. I worked with progressives. I worked with conservatives. I worked with parents who were artists and lawyers and entrepreneurs. Um, and I worked with parents who were cops and nurses. I worked with a broad range of people. And that's what we need to do in Congress, constantly defining 50% of the country as undesirables that you can't work with because you're better and you're smarter is not actually any kind of solution to get things done in Congress. I think you have to sit down with your fellow Americans in a tradition of respect and say, we may not agree on everything, but we can find areas where we do agree with each other. And that's the hard work. And I'm deeply committed to doing it. And I've done it as a parent leader here in this city. Thank you. Assembly Member New. Um, so your question is about the climate in Congress, not climate change, correct? No, actually, my question is about the, the existential crises that face us as a country from, from white supremacist autocracy to climate change um, okay. to extreme wealth and the fact that Congress has been proving itself to be an ineffective place to make change. How, 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 why are you seeking a seat in Congress given that? So everything I do, every policy I approach is through a racial justice lens, a disability lens, a socioeconomic justice lens, an environmental justice lens. And I think that, you know, we have to make sure that we are providing those lenses um, every single time that we are in any position that we are in. And so that's what we try to do to make sure that we have movement. Um, and I have to say that, you know, uh, it's, it's interesting because um, we can't say that we can't make that change, right? There are just powerful people who want us to be, um, you know, given this uh, myth or this secret. And this is what I was talking about, how like they think that we can't make this change. They want us to be convinced of that. And that's why it's so important to break that myth. Um, we can't say that we can't because we've done, right? So, um, for example, um, you know, in, in the state assembly, you know, you know, other you know, folks would probably remember. I mean, I was elected the same day that Trump was. So, you know, it was a very interesting moment. But our state Senate was actually a Democratic majority. But the Dem there was a group of Democrats that voted with the Republicans and gave the Republicans the ability to be able to control the Senate. And so that was known as the IDC. And, um, you know, I had to help to make sure that we actually turned our Senate around by electing different people. And I think that, you know, we have to one by one dismantle um, that myth and make the change that we want to see. And, you know, we have to, as a state, deliver um, to the public on all these different things that we have promised folks. And I think that, you know, um, people always told me that I was doing, you know, asking for the impossible, whether it was Thank state you. funding Time's or um, capital dollars for public housing or um, you know, changing up. our sexual harassment laws. So I think that we have to be able to continue to do Thank the impossible. You. Thank you. Time's up. Well, I hope you all are right and that you're going to be able to make change in Congress. Um, we need it. Okay, next question. Fifth question. The wall between church and state seems to be crumbling. Both sides of the First Amendment have offered important protections for Jewish Americans. Now the Establishment Clause has been watered down by the Supreme Court, applying a Christian view of abortion and opening the way for Christian prayer on the football field and direct funding of religious school education. And the Free Exercise Clause has inter has been interpreted so that a baker can refuse selling a cake to a couple celebrating a same-sex marriage. This issue plays out in New York in many ways, including with the court decisions challenging the vaccine mandate 
and the ongoing fight over whether yeshivas, like other federally funded non-public schools, must meet equivalency standards for secular studies. Your bully pulpit really matters. Can you succinctly explain where you stand on these important questions of religious freedom and separation of church and state in light of the recent Supreme Court decisions and the controversies arising in connection with these issues in New York? So it's vaccine mandates, tuition tax credits, and sec secular education requirements for yeshiva students. We're gonna start with Assembly Member Simon. Uh, so vaccine mandates, tuition tax credits. And, and requiring um, and secular education in, for yeshiva students. Okay. So I think the issue about secular education uh, in yeshivas is not about requiring sec secular education. It's about uh, equivalency to the curriculum That's right. that all students in That's New York exactly State right. are, deemed, are, are deemed supposed to be uh, exposed to. Um, and I think that that issue comes up not just only in yeshivas, but it certainly has been uh, an issue for the yeshivas. So, yes, we do need to educate our children. We also need to respect religious education. Um, and, you know, I went to Catholic school. Um, I learned a lot about, um, uh, you know, uh, the Virgin Mary in math class for sometimes. So the reality is that, you know, there is room for making, but I learned math. And so that's really the question, right? Um, uh, the other issue is vaccine mandates. You know, I was met a guy the other day. I know you did too about uh, whether or not uh, my, you know, my body, my choice translates to vaccines. Vaccines are about public health. We have an obligation to the public's health. We have an obligation to each other. That is what being a part of the community of of human beings is about. About human rights and respect and dignity is that we need to protect each other and we need to conform our activities when a public health crisis exists. That is not the same as having a right to make, uh, having bodily autonomy and having a right to make a, a choice to choose. And then the other was the tuition so, tax credits in New York I State. Cut you off, sorry. I was opposed up. them and I wrote to every bishop Thank you. and opposed them. Thank Time's you. Up. All right, uh, Mr. Goldman. Um, you raise a lot of issues. The, the the influence of uh, religion in our society is um, becoming very concerning. And I think when you have far-right religious views making decisions for women as to whether or not they can choose to have an abortion, we've got a real problem. And there is no separation of church and state there. The government must stay out of it. Other people's opinions must stay out of the medical room. But it goes beyond that because we have just one religion that is now infiltrating our entire government. There's an important lawsuit brought by a synagogue in Florida opposing uh, the Florida ban on abortion because in Judaism, the women's health, it, women, the health of a mother is a reason to get an abortion. And so this is actually inflicting one religion onto another. And I'll be very interested to see how that happens because that is blatant religious discrimination. Um, as for yeshivas, my wife went to a yeshiva, her whole family went to yeshivas. Uh, it is a very important part of the Jewish community and we have to support it in every way we can. But we also have to abide by our state laws and we have to make sure that people are getting substantially equivalent legislation, uh, education rather. I will work very hard to support yeshiva education because it is incredibly important Thank you. Time up. and Time's to up. provide additional resources, but we have to have uniform educational standards. Thank you. Congressman Jones. Thank you. The only thing that has changed about the meaning of the Establishment Clause and freedom of speech in this country is the fact that now we've got six far right Supreme Court justices on the court, on the highest court in the land. And we have now seen as a result of that, that this majority is on a rampage against the basic freedoms of the American people. It's why I introduced legislation, not only to add four seats to the Supreme Court, to restore balance and integrity but also to make sure, as I fight, that we are working to limit the jurisdiction of this court, which I've been leading the effort to do, 
turns out most of the cases the court decides are because Congress has specifically legislated jurisdiction of the court to do that. And yes, I introduced legislation with Hank Johnson to have finally a binding code of ethics for Supreme Court justices. On the particular questions uh, of uh, yeshiva education, we all know that the New York State Constitution requires that every kid in this state have what's called a sound basic education. So yes, I support the substantial equivalency requirements, and we can do that while also continuing to, uh, uh, to support yeshivas and facilitating their flourishing in communities that decide to have them. I'm also really proud uh, to be someone who uh, wants to have a pluralistic society where people of various faiths are allowed to choose their own destinies. Thank, Thank you. you. Congresswoman Holtzman. Uh, thank you very much. Um, there's no question that we now have a Supreme Court that's trying to um, undo the kind of compact that we had for a long time in this country in many areas. I just want to answer briefly, I'm opposed to tuition tax credits. We have to make our public schools work. Secondly, I, um, on the vaccine mandate, of course, we have to have people inoculated. That's a public health issue. And with regard to issue of secular education, you know, democracy cannot work unless people are educated. That's something I think we've learned in this past year or so with the extreme right wing. People have to be educated. And if we deprive students of basic knowledge, and more important than the knowledge itself, the ability to learn how to make a reasoned decision, then we are threatening our very survival as a country. So, I, and I want to go back to the point I made about the Supreme Court. Right now, we have a number of court justices who may not be legitimate. Brett Kavanaugh's investigation was cut off. Clarence Thomas is now engaged in a refused to recuse himself and voted in a case that would have protected his wife. Someone needs to look at this. And maybe if we found out the truth and it was adverse. Time's up. Maybe these people would have to be removed from the court. Thank you. Ms. Marin. Thank you. Let me just say we've heard a lot about um, a woman's right to choose. As a lifelong pro-choice feminist, I think it's really important that we all just acknowledge that not a single woman in New York lost the right to choose because of the Dobbs decision. We have codified in New York state law um, the Roe v. Wade uh, provision protections. So let's be honest about that. And in Congress, if we wanted to extend um, the right to choose through, a, through federal legislation to the women in the country who have lost it, we're going to have to compromise. And we're going to have to come up with protections that, that, more, that look more similar to what they have in Western Europe and in places where women have had the access, uh, the right to abortion through the legislature. Ruth Bader Ginsburg it, herself, one of the finest legal minds this country has ever seen, talked about the deficiencies of Roe v. Wade as a legal decision. I was unhappy to see it overturned, but let's be honest about what's actually going on in the country, because if we want to extend the right to choose to women who have actually lost it, we're going to need to speak honestly about the problem. Tuition tax credit, my father and his brothers attended yeshivas right here in Brooklyn, and the reality is um, I don't, I'm the only person up here who has children right now in the, the New York City public school we absolutely should not be turning over the education of yeshivas to the Department of Education, which can't even educate its own children, the own students that are in the school system right now. And with regard to vaccine mandates, when I say my body, my choice, I mean it. I don't think we should be compelled to get vaccines that um, we have very good reason to have skepticism about. Time's up. Thank you. Mr. Robinson. I want to take five seconds to pay homage and respect to uh, Congressman Holtzman and all that she has accomplished. Um, I did say modern progressives, and I want to clarify that. We're talking about the climate right now. Um, that said, what the Supreme Court did, uh, removing the woman's right to choose, is absolutely abhorrent. And I was very sad to see it happen. Um, the reality is now we need to empower Democrats that can be attractive in red states to go and change it at the state level. Um, as far as yeshivas go, um, 
I don't think you could both support yeshivas, but also support uniformity in school systems. I think that's a, uh, that's a, a contrary uh, argument. Uh, so you either support the yeshivas or you don't. And for me, that is a freedom of religion question, and it's a cultural preservation question. I do support the yeshivas. And, you know, if we're talking about who's getting educated, our own Congressman Nadler was a yeshiva-educated individual, and he is a congressman. So let's support the yeshivas. Um, as far as uh, the rogue right-wing, ultra-right-wing uh, Supreme Court and the vanishing church and state line, we can't let that happen because this whole country was founded upon the separation of church and state. This is why the revolution started. One of the main reasons the American revolution was because the imposition of religion on people's lives was something that was resented. Thank you. Thank you. Congresswoman Rivera. I'm sorry, Council Member Rivera. Thank you. Since a woman's right, the decision over bodily autonomy came up, let me just say that what we're doing in New York is incredibly important for the rest of the country. We have to lead the way and ensure that there is access to services so that people who are already coming here from out of state can receive those services, and that includes contraception, and those are bills that I have passed on long-acting reversible contraception and abortion pills. This is especially important because we need to be the model for other states that are closer, adjacent to states with outright restrictions or bans. Vaccines are absolutely about public health. Our departments of health were created to address the health of the population we as a city. So it's important that we communicate, that we're constantly in contact with people, that we're not just communicating with Democrats every two years, that we are constantly communicating the benefits of our policies and ensuring that people know what to do. Uh, you asked about um, I, no tax credits, no vouchers, just to put it simply. And for education, we have to ensure that every student whether yeshiva or in the public school system, receives a fair and good education. It is our obligation that there are standards, that there are requirements, and that we are serving everyone with dignity and with respect. Thank you. Assemblymember member New. Uh, thank you so much for that question. And I also wanted to just address the fact that, you know, um, on the state level, we have, um, you know, codified our uh, abortion rights, but we also need to make sure that we are funding um, the services and programs. And so that's one of the things that um, is still coming and we still need to make sure that we're you know, we're doing that. We just went up to Albany uh, a couple of weeks ago, not even a couple, I guess several weeks ago, um, to pass um, the Equal Rights Amendment. And that also helps to make sure that we are actually making it accessible to everyone. Um, so uh, it's true that we should be making our state a example. Um, I also wanted to just uh, talk about, um, you know, the fact that, you know, we have um, several things uh, here. We have to, you know, acknowledge that we have um, incredible services and, um, you know, incredible, uh, you know, amazing things that are, you know, serving our Jewish community that is serving everyone, actually, like Hatsala. You know, I think that we have to make sure that we're funding, um, you know, the Hatsala. I have personally funded the Hatsala, and I think that it's really important that we are um, making sure that we have, um, you know, funding also to our yeshivas for protection, et cetera. I personally have also made sure that there are cameras and things like that for the um, for the protection of our yeshivas. Um, you know, my my uh, yeshivas uh, here have actually been very, um, you know, have felt like it was very important to make sure that they are meeting the equivalencies. So um, that's something that we've actually helped to make sure that, you know, they can do um, financially. And I think that there are things that we um, can do to help. Um, and I think that uh, right now, um, for when we're talking about vaccines, we have to make sure that Thank people you. understand that someone's rights end when another's begins. So because we've realized that we are interconnected now with this pandemic more so than ever, you know, my health care affects your health care, your health care affects mine. Thank you. The final question is a fun one, but very important, and I hope you answer the question in 30 seconds. What is your favorite Jewish deli or bagel store in the 10th district, and what's your go-to order? Councilwoman Rivera. 
there are so many. I like, because I like pastries from like Moishe's, but I also like, well, Kosar's is under new management. But uh, I would say that those pastries are delicious. I mean, if I get a bagel, I'm, I, I like bagels. I know what you're saying. In New Yorker, you better love bagels. Um, I like cream cheese. I like lox. I also like a nice cinnamon raisin bagel with um, cream. I know. Hold on. Wait for it. It stays sweet. Thank cream you. Cream cheese and jelly. Mr. Robinson. <laughs> the answer is simple. It's cat's deli. Ms. Marin. I'm sorry? Oh. And what you go to order? Pastrami on rye, obviously. Russian dressing, okay. a lot of it, and a bunch of pickles. Thanks. Uh, for my family, it's Russ and Daughters uh, to get bagels and lox on Sunday morning. And for me, it's a sesame bagel, bagel, cream cheese, lox, uh, red onion, thinly sliced, and tomato. <laughs> Assemblywoman, you. Oh, I, I so... Colossars are so good, and I always do the, oh, Jesus, sorry, my computer. Um, I always do the um, everything bagel with sable. I love sable. I could eat a pound of it, actually. And then I like the dessert sandwiches. In which deli is that? Colossars? Okay. Thank you. Uh, Assemblywoman Simon. Can I get this for her? Oh, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would say Russ and Daughters. I'm really happy that there's now uh, Russ and Daughters at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So Russ and Daughters has come to Brooklyn in a big way. Um, and uh, my favorite is pretty plain, just to have a bagel with cream cheese and lox, one of my favorite things. Mr. Goldman. Uh, two quick answers. Deli has to be Katz's in the district. Uh, I actually like to have both pastrami and corned beef on rye with mustard. Russ and Daughters is where you got to get your bagels. That's where we go for our breakfast for Yom Kippur. Uh, we got the regular lox, cream cheese, but you got to add the capers. Congressman Jones. Yeah. There's a spot called Bagels by the Park on Smith Street in Carroll Gardens where I live, and I get bagels with lox. Everything bagel, toasted lox. Um. I don't often get to Russ and Daughters, although that's probably my favorite, but Shelsky's is my go-to deli, and uh, they have something called Fancy Pants that's a sandwich with a lot of good stuff on it, including lox and sturgeon and onion and tomatoes. It's pretty good. Thank you. Hopefully, uh, everybody will make up their choice based on the answer to this question. Just, just kidding. Uh, if the candidates still have time, uh, I would give you an opportunity, uh, but 60 seconds, please, for closing remarks. Uh, we'll start with you, um, Assemblywoman Yu. Oh, thank you all again for taking the time during this uh, very long week to get involved, ask questions, and remind everyone that the 10th District is one of the most politically engaged communities in the country. And when we are this engaged, we deserve a congressperson who can take that energy, that passion, and that drive for progressive change and turn it into real lasting policy in Washington. Um, I know how to do that because I've obviously spent six years doing it in Albany, bringing home big wins to fight hate, improve our affordable housing, and defend our climate. Um, doing things that people thought were impossible um, because even when um, my own party said those wins were impossible, uh, we were able to make that change because we had the political courage to ask and to fight. So I'm asking for more than your vote. I'm asking for your belief that we can and must do better. I'm asking for your voices and for your belief in a better and more inclusive city, state, and country because when we build coalitions so big and so loud that they can't be ignored, that's when we score our biggest wins for our people. So let's take that winning form of Washington and show them how we do things here in New York. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Maron. Thank you. Um, well, thank you very much for everyone who stayed all this time. I would say that I present um, a real alternative to some of what we've seen recently in Washington, D.C. I would be a congresswoman who would actually work with people across a wide spectrum of ideas and beliefs, and I think that's what we're going to need as Democrats to get anything done in the next Congress because um, it is very likely, historically, it's very likely that the president's party loses seats in the midterm elections. It's particular to this moment in time, but it's also historically um, 
very common. So if we're going to have progress on the issues that we care about here in the 10th District and the issues that are important to us that happen on a federal level, we're going to need to send somebody to Congress who can work collaboratively with the people who are in Congress. I can do two things. I can stand up for the things that I actually believe in and fight for them. I've done it time and time again here in the city. And I can also work collaboratively with a wide range of people. And I think that's a winning combination. And I'd ask for your support and your vote uh, in the upcoming election. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. I think we're at a crossroads right now. Um, I've mentioned civility on the federal level, and I mean it. Uh, we need to find some common grounds. And if it doesn't happen, it's, we're going to reach a time where we wish we did come to the table with better intentions. Um, you know, as a small business owner, leadership is not new to me. Uh, as an author, I bring a creative side to me as well. Um, solutions, no matter what the context is, I will find them, and I will make them work. Uh, I think we need a moderate right now more than ever. People who can reach across the aisle for things like small businesses, for things like climate resiliency and community input, and for public safety. And I would ask for your vote. I also I think it's very important that somebody who represents the 10th District in New York City, really the center of Jewish diaspora, um, we need somebody who's pro-Israel. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Rivera. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you to everyone who facilitated, who joined us. Um, this was a very fair space, and I thought it gave us an opportunity to present who we are and how we'll govern and, and overall our demeanor. I am building a coalition that I hope will include all of you in this room. I've been endorsed by Congresswoman Nidia Velasquez, Congressman Adriano Espaillat, 1199, TWU, Voters for Animal Rights, the 504 Democratic Club, which centers the disability community, and countless community leaders, district leaders, state committee people, and many, many others. I am someone that intends to represent New York's 10th congressional district with fairness, honesty, and respect, to understand and be sensitive to our international and local concerns, and always represent us proudly, humbly, and openly. I am someone who has roots in this district. I am proud that all my memories and milestones have happened right here in NY10. But my record speaks for itself. Please check out carlinarivera.nyc to see what I have done for our city and what I'll continue to strive to do. Thank and you. thank you so much. I humbly ask for your support. Thank you, Assemblywoman Simon. Thank you. My entire career has been about lifting the voices of people who have been marginalized in our society. I'm the grandchild of immigrants. I grew up in a working class neighborhood in Yonkers, and I've made this district my home for the last 41 years. This is a district that I know well. I have worked and served as a community leader throughout this district. And I will tell you that I have taken bold stances. I have been ahead of the curve on progressive transportation. I have been ahead of the curve on a reform of the Brooklyn Democratic Party. I have been ahead of the curve in standing up to the abusive county leader, Vito Lopez. And I've also been a leader in my, in my field of law, where I have tried uh, major cases, seminal cases in this, law, in the, this field, um, because of creative problem-solving skills. And I can tell you that I will never back down on LGBTQ rights. I will never back down on the rights of uh, people um, who are the whole, I will never back down on the rights of the people who live here to have a dignified life. And that means that I am not beholden to real estate developers. I am going to work closely with every level of government and with all of my colleagues. I have a very Thank strong you. track record in the assembly working with colleagues on both sides of the aisle. Thank you. And being Assembly highly Goldman. respected because I can work with everyone. And I will do that in Congress. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Goldman. Thank you, Jacob. My grandmother escaped anti-Semitism in Russia and came here and lived the American dream. And she taught us growing up Jewish values, which I have tried to pass on to my five children. But I'm very concerned about the future of this country for my five children, four girls, whether they're going to have the right to choose, whether we're going to be operating in a democracy, whether we're going to have a climate that we, with air that we can breathe and with uh, rivers and seas that are actually not overflowing. 
And so we have these existential crises that we have to solve. And you will hear so many ideas, and there are so many important policies that we all up here believe in. But the question is, who is actually going to make a difference so that my five children can live in a different country than what we're facing right now? I have the creativity, I have the experience in Washington being effective, proving the case and standing up against Donald Trump, and I will bring that creativity to get results for the progressive ideals that we all believe in. Thank you, Congressman Jones. Thank you so much, and thank you all for taking time out of your very busy schedules to be with us all tonight. I am so excited to be running for a second term in Congress to represent this beautifully diverse district that has given so much to me. I'm a leading progressive member of Congress with a track record of actually delivering results. And I've been fighting for the communities that comprise this district, getting billions of dollars in infrastructure money that can be used for climate resiliency and to prepare our roads and our bridges, leading the fight to end gun violence, pushing this administration and, yes, the United States Senate to enact humane immigration policy, helping to get Build Back Better passed through the House, which contains tens of billions of dollars in NYCHA investments and creating 300,000 additional Section 8 housing vouchers. These and so many other things, including saving our ailing democracy, these are the things I'm fighting to continue doing in Congress. And yes, I'm proud to have local endorsements like Grand Street Democrats and labor unions like RWDSU and National Nurses United, but also to be endorsed by the Congressional Progressive Thank you. Caucus. Congresswoman Haltzman. Um, I haven't been in government or I should say in elective office in a number of years. And some of you are asking me, why am I returning now? Because we are living, as I said before, in dangerous times. And it's not enough just to be able to vote right. It's not enough to be able just to write the right laws. It's not enough to be able to stand up at press conferences. You have to be able to get results. And that's one of the things I said to myself, I'm not a sidelines person. I can't sit on the sidelines while the Supreme Court wants to destroy the ability of, of women to control their bodies and take away our rights. I'm not gonna sit by while a president steals an election. I'm not going to sit by while MAGA Republicans want further to enable these actions to take place. There's a long record I had. Republicans supported every one of the bills that I got through, whether it was on the Equal Rights Amendment, whether it was on refugee rights, whether it was on bringing crime-fighting money to New York. I bring creativity, and I bring skill, and I bring know-how. And that's what we need. We need someone who can get the laws passed, but I think we may have problems in doing that, but who knows how to go outside that. I mentioned investigations of the Supreme Court. The President of the United Thank States you. and states and localities Time's have up. the power on guns. They haven't used it. That's the kind Thank of thing Time's that I up. think we'll have to do that I want to do if I get elected. I'd be proud to do that. Thank you. This concludes our forum. I want to thank everyone for being here tonight. I want to thank especially... Let's give that round of applause to these candidates. Because everyone who was here tonight is here because you care so much about the future of our district, the future of our country. But these candidates are giving their time and their life energy and their dedication to try to change things. And I just want to thank you all so much for taking time with us tonight to share your vision, to share your ideas, to listen to each other and to us. And... Um, and I, I wish you all the best success, and thank you for, for wanting to give yourself to serve our country. Thank you all for being here tonight.